I do have a, a quick exercise for the children. So kids, if, if you've gotten seated, young people, if you're seated and uh, you want to pay attention, I want you to, to think about this for a moment. Uh, when I was in grade school, I remember once uh, at the, in the, in the, the main office, uh, I don't think I was there because I was in trouble. I don't remember being in trouble at this point. I, I did get in trouble at times, but this wasn't one of them. And I remember on the wall next to the secretary's desk was a, a giant poster of um, Robert Frost's poem, you know, the one about two roads diverging in the woods. You remember that one? And I took the road less traveled or whatever that was. I still remember that being there. And, and so I want, I want you kids to picture for a minute uh, some woods with, with a road, but instead of it diverging and going two different directions, um, it separates and goes to two bridges that are side by side that cross a great chasm. And there's two people, one at each bridge, and they're both getting ready to cross on the bridge in front of them. Now, the bridges look identical. They can't tell which one is better or worse. They both look the same, and they both look like they're in working order. However, one of the people is about to step foot on a bridge that the minute they put their weight on it, it's going to collapse, and they're going to fall to their demise. The other one is about to step foot on a bridge that is structurally sound and will safely deliver them to the other side. They can't tell which one's which, and they don't know which one is which. They just are putting whatever faith they have in the bridge they're about to cross, and they're about to cross, and, and the one at the broken bridge has a lot of faith that when he steps on it, it's going to hold him up, and he's going to be just fine. The other one on the, the bridge that works fine has just a teeny little bit of faith that it's going to work. And my question for you is this, kids. Which bridge will deliver them to safety? Think about that. Think about it. The broken bridge with the person who has a lot of faith in it or the, the non-broken bridge for the person that has very little faith. Now, while you're thinking about that, I want everyone else in here who has a Bible to turn to Exodus chapter 12. If you grabbed one of our guest Bibles in the back, we'll be on uh, pages 56 and 57. Um, I want to read a, a, a selection of this chapter to you, and then uh, afterwards I'll go and we'll give a little bit of context and get everybody kind of caught up what's going on here in, at this point in the book of Exodus, uh, and then we'll dive into the message here. Look in uh, Exodus 21, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 12, beginning in verse 21. <clears throat> then Moses called all the elders of Israel together and said to them, go pick out a lamb or a young goat for each of your families and slaughter the Passover animal. Drain the blood into a basin, then take a bundle of hyssop branches and dip it into the blood. Brush the hyssop across the top and sides of the door frames of your houses, and no one may go out through the door until morning, for the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the door frame, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. Remember, these instructions are a permanent law that you and your descendants must observe forever. When you enter the land the Lord has promised to give you, you will continue to observe this ceremony. Then your children will ask, what does this ceremony mean? And you will reply, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord. For he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt, and though he struck the Egyptians, he spared our families." When Moses had finished speaking, all the people bowed down to the ground and worshiped. Now to fully understand Exodus chapter 12, it's beneficial to flip back all the way to Exodus chapter 1, which you don't have to do that right now, but I just wanted to point out in Exodus chapter 1, we learn the story of how uh, the Israelites have grown into a great and mighty nation while being residents in Egypt. And because Pharaoh was worried that they would turn on him and basically take things over, he and, the, and his taskmasters subjected the Israelites to a, a, a brutal form of captivity and enslavement. Verses 11 through 14 detail that there. In chapter 1, it talks about the, the Egyptians' oppression and enslavement, uh, t taking them and abusing them and oppressing them, how uh, they made their lives bitter. They were ruthless in all their demands. And the picture that is being painted for us from right there from the very first chapter of this book is that God's people have no hope of escape unless God himself comes and makes a way. And fortunately for them, we can come to chapter 3 and see there in verses 7 and 8 exactly that. It says, the Lord told him, that's Moses, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. And so, verse 8. 
I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. And that brings us to the first point of the message as we're going to contemplate these verses in chapter 12. And it is this. If you're a note taker, this is what you write down. God is a gracious God. The story of Exodus is the story of a God who delivers. He delivered the Israelites from the tyranny of Pharaoh and the harshness of their taskmasters and the squalor and the hopelessness hopelessness of their poverty. It is a story of hope. It is a story of optimism. And it is a story about the power of God to save. But I want you to take chapter 12, and I didn't read it a moment ago, so if you would, look at verse 12. It's just a few verses prior to where we started a moment ago. And I want you to look at something here that points to a deeper dimension of what Israel needed deliverance from. So after a a series of plagues that God has brought into the land to try to force Pharaoh to let his people go, we come to verse 12, and it says this. On that night, that is on the Passover night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. You see, God's judgment upon the Egyptians was more than just punishment for their harsh treatment of the Israelites. No, God's judgment was against the entire religious system of the Egyptians that was set up in opposition to the truth. The truth, by the way, which is right before their very eyes. For for how many decades, how many centuries, were God's people right there in the heart of Egypt proclaiming the truth? And yet, the Egyptians had set up their whole system in opposition to the truth. And judgment is coming upon the land. And along with it comes God's promise to deliver his people through it. Now that is a pattern that scriptures have from, well, right up towards the very beginning of the Bible. In fact, just a few weeks ago, we talked about the story of Noah. Very early within the the course of human history, what took place in the story of Noah? We saw it, that judgment was coming to the world. And and, and, and in a world, by the way, which we're told is exceedingly wicked, I mean, Even the the very thoughts and imaginations of all the people were only ever wicked all the time. And God's judgment was coming to a world like that. And yet, the gracious God made a way for his people to be delivered through his judgment. You see the pattern. And, and, And from it, we gain this really incredible and powerful and key principle to understanding the nature of salvation throughout the scriptures. And that is this. Only God's powerful mercy can deliver from God's righteous and powerful wrath. Did you catch that? Only God's powerful mercy can deliver you from God's righteous and powerful wrath. And every man-made religion in all the world represents mankind's attempt to placate the gods, to, to curry the favor of the gods, to make them happy, to secure for themselves life after death. Look no further than the Egyptians. I mean, is there an ancient culture or any culture where this fact is more evident than in the lives of the ancient Egyptians? I mean, how many of you have seen documentaries or gone to museums and seen artifacts from from that era in in human history? I mean, every archaeological discovery just reveals the, the, the depths that they would go in their practices and in their beliefs and in their superstitions to appease the gods and gain access to the afterlife. And they're famous for it. We, we, we know this about the ancient Egyptians, and yet their efforts are essentially no different than every other man-made religion in the world. If they can just somehow do all the right things, if they can somehow just make all the right provisions for themselves, then somehow they will be protected from the finality and the hopelessness of death. But that's never the story of the Bible. There is no protection from judgment or access to life after death in mankind's own effort to save or protect or provide for himself. No one escapes the wrath of God by their own designs. No, he must deliver. And he is a delivering God. 
And for the people in Moses' day, he did just that. And oh, by the way, he did it in the most unlikely of, of means. He did it through the blood of a lamb. Point number two, there is life in the blood. <laughs> now, some of you in, involved in the medical profession, you're already automatically thinking biologically, and you're right. There's, there's two senses in which this statement is true, that there's life in the blood. In fact, the scriptures affirm this um, in Le- Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the body is in the blood, or in its blood, where there is blood there is life, and everyone knows this. It's a basic fact about human biology. If, if, you, if you're out of blood, guess what? You're out of life. Some 20 years or so ago, my, um, well, almost 20 years, I guess, at this point, my, my, one of my brother's father-in-law, no, not that he had multiple fathers-in-law. I have two brothers. So one of my brothers, his father-in-law, um, was needing some help moving some things at his house. And I went there along with my other brother and, and maybe a handful of other people, and we were moving all these heavy things, and, and I noticed that the father-in-law wasn't helping. Now, me being very immature, carnal, sinful, self-centered Sean at the time, I'm, I'm smiling, carrying his stuff, and I'm thinking, why aren't you carrying your own stuff too? Why am I carrying your stuff for you? Well, I, I didn't find out until later, and much to my great humility and shame that he apparently had some kind of, has some kind of heart condition that requires taking really powerful blood thinners. And what would happen to someone like that if, if he dropped a cabinet or hit his shin or, God forbid, had fell down somehow trying to move something heavy? Well, if, the, if he's ruptured, if the skin is, is broken and the vessels are exposed and the blood begins to flow, what could happen? That would be very bad. <laughs> Why? Well, because you lose your blood, enough of it, you lose your life. So obviously, Pastor Sean, life is in the blood. I get that. But there's a second sense in the scriptures in which life is in the blood that the the scriptures emphasize. Yes, the physical life of the body is in our blood, but spiritual life comes by the shedding of the blood of another. That is the blood of sacrifice. In Leviticus 17, 11, which I just read a moment ago, catches both of these essences. It's on the screen. Yes, the life of the body is in its blood, but as Yahweh is speaking to his people, he continues, he says, I have given you the blood on the altar, not your blood, mind you. Not your blood, Israel. I ask none of you to cut yourself or to sacrifice yourself or your children. And and by doing so, he sets himself apart from the pagan religions who cut themselves, sacrificed their children. You can find that type of sacrificial offering all throughout paganism throughout the ancient world. And by the way, modern day paganism does it too, but in different forms. We're not even going to go there this morning, but we will when we have to. No, I've given you blood on the altar, not your blood, but the blood of another. To what end? To purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life. Blood that makes purification possible. And so right at the very heart of the Old Testament sacrificial system is this idea that sacrificial death enables life. That the life of a victim, symbolized by its blood, could be released for another. That the life of a victim is forfeited that another might live. And this is the operating principle at work on the night of the Passover, by the way. As the angel of death in judgment moves throughout the land. I read it a moment ago. Kids, I hope you were listening closely. I know I caught the attention of probably the majority of, of the young boys in here when I started talking about cutting animals and blood being collected in bowls and all the gross stuff. Boys are like, what? There's what, what blood, bowls of blood. And, yeah, and girls, you painters, you artistic types, maybe you were thinking about the, the paint, that <laughs> maybe you weren't, I don't know. It, we're tr- trying to take something gruesome and making it, you know, kid-friendly. It's kind of hard to do, but it's better than last week's message, right? There's no way last week's was going to be kid-friendly, so we're going to do the best with what we've got. But we saw it in the story. You know, so before they feasted on this, this, this animal that was sacrificed, they had to collect the blood. And then they took the, the plant branches, like, like a paintbrush, and they, they painted their door frames. They marked their doors with the blood. And the question is, why? 
Why did God ask them to do something so gross and so gruesome? Well, to signify something powerful and important. That this family had put their trust, yes, in a holy God. They knew, they knew God was coming. They knew that there was judgment and wrath to be executed upon the land. And yet they put their trust in not just a holy God, not just a vengeful God, but a merciful God. One who provides a way, yes, a costly way, blood had to be spilled. It wasn't free, it wasn't cheap, but it was a way where someone innocent would die so that others might live. And in this way, John Chrysostom, who, by the way, is a, one of the church fathers from uh, the late end of the fourth century, he was a bishop of Constantinople. He is the one who authored the divine liturgy used by the Orthodox Church to this day. So 1,600 year old uh, liturgy of worship was penned by this magnificent father of the church. And because of all these things, as he understood what was going on in the book of Exodus, he could say, the blood of the lamb was the life of Israel. And this night would shape the identity in the worship of God's people for centuries to come. Look at the command. Again, in verse 24, remember, these instructions are a permanent law. You will observe it forever. When you enter the land the Lord has promised, you will continue to observe this ceremony. Then your children will ask, what does it mean? And you will reply, it's the Passover sacrifice. For he passed over the houses in, of the Israelites in Egypt. And though he struck the Egyptians, he spared our families. Why remember this night? Well, yes, to remember what God has done. To remember the, the kind of faithful, delivering, merciful God that he is. But on this side of history, we know that this permanent law was not simply to look back and remember. No, this was meant to prepare them for something greater to come. And this is point number three. Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. Next week will be our first Sunday in, um, we're up to May now, aren't we? Can believe how <clears throat> the year is just flying by. First Sunday in May, um, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. And we're going to remember those words of Jesus to his disciples on the night he was betrayed. That is the night that he celebrated this very observance together with his disciples for the final time. And, and while he was observing this with the disciples, while they were remembering the sacrifice of that first Passover, Jesus did something radical. As he was rehearsing the story for them, as a good rabbi would, he changed the story. Did you know that? He changed it. As he held the bread in his hands and, and raised the cup, he said, this is my body. During the past, this is the Passover meal. They're remembering the bread of their affliction. The, un, the unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread remi reminds them of how they, they swept the leaven out of their house in preparation of the Exodus and they, they ate this, this unleavened bread and Jesus would have, as a good Jew, held that bread and called, this is the bread of affliction. He remembers the, the past Passover. But as he held that and as he held this cup of wine, he says, no, 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 no. No, listen, this is my body and my blood. Jesus changes the story of the Passover. And it wasn't a, vi a violation of this, this permanent law laid forth in the Old Testament. No, this was in fulfillment of it. It was the fulfillment of it. It's what it was all about. It was what it was pointing to from the very onset in the life of, history, uh, life of Israel's history. In essence, Jesus is saying, what happened then is all about me. It all points to me. Passover is not about the blood of those lambs, nor any of the lambs, nor any of the animals, the millions of sacrifices that have been made over the course of 1,500 years or however long the period of time was. No, the Passover is all about my body and my blood shed for you. What every drop of blood that was ever spilled in all of history pointed to. It was all about me. All those sacrifices foreshadowed the once and for all time sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Christ who, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, is our Passover lamb. You see the connection? 
the blood he gave releases his life to us. Life that never ends. A life that was forfeit that others might live. First Peter 1, 18 and 19, Peter says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. No, 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 no. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless what? Lamb of God. Peter's referring to the immense buying power of the, the blood of Christ. It's worth, worth more than any precious metal that there is in the world. Doesn't matter how precious it is or how, what the quantity you have of it is, you cannot buy your way to heaven. There's no amount of treasures buried with you in your tomb. Sorry, ancient pharaohs. It doesn't matter what they, they placed in your burial chamber. Because what's going to happen? Well, the thieves are going to discover where that is, and they're going to break in, and they're going to steal all of it. And that's why when they find burial chambers today, they're empty, except maybe some bones. You can't take it with you. It stays right where you left it. No earthly payment, no earthly provision can change your situation for eternity. Only the blood of Jesus can redeem us from a meaningful life today and open to us a glorious eternity forever. At the very beginning of that same letter, Peter says in verse 2, you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, which, by the way, takes this whole idea of Passover and the benefits of the sacrifice to a whole nother level. It's powerful. What Peter is saying is the blood doesn't just cover you. It doesn't just shelter you and protect you from judgment. Oh, it goes even deeper than that. The blood purifies you and cleanses you from the inside out. In other words, Jesus' offer of his own life is not just a band-aid to cover up for your sins and protect you from wrath. And by the way, it does cover your sins and protect you from wrath. And thanks be to God, it does that. Thank you, Jesus. But it also purifies you. It makes you clean. And it's not just a band-aid. It's more like a blood transfusion. His life coursing through the veins of your soul. Transforming you from the inside out. So you're not just set for the future. Thank you. The purchase has been made. The debt has been canceled. I'm covered. When judgment comes, I'm set for eternity to come. Thanks be to God. Oh, it's not just that. You can have hope to be a new creature today. You don't have to wait for the future benefits of Christ's sacrifice. It starts now. Yes, last week, I was very pessimistic about the state of natural man. <laughs> I mean, we, you can't apologize for it. Judges 19 exposes the extent of, of human depravity. That we, we are all corrupt and fleshly and self-centered and defiled. Whatever else you want to fill in the blank here. So absolutely, we're, we're pessimistic about man apart from God. And Judges 19 will do that. But oh, listen, that's not the whole story. And it's not even saying, I'm not even just saying that, that the rest of the story is that you remain what you were. God just protects you from his wrath. That's half the rest of the story. Because the total rest of the story is not only does he cover you and shield you and shelter you, he changes you. So yes, we're pessimistic about man because the scriptures are pessimistic about man, but the scriptures are optimistic about grace. What his salvation does in the life of a person, it's not just rescue from hell, it's entry into heaven and heaven's entry into you. It's all about his grace, his marvelous, matchless, endless, infinite grace. Grace that pardons, oh, but grace that cleanses within. Grace that is greater than all our sins. But there's one last final caveat to all of this. Though God was making a way to be saved through his judgment, none of the Israelites would be safe just because blood had been spilled. Think about that for a second. It wasn't just the act 
of the blood being spilled that saved them. Knowing this principle that life is in the blood, merely intellectually assenting to and agreeing with what God said about the blood was not enough. Even the spilled blood itself was not able to save unless what? What had to happen? They had to put it on the door. They had to put it on the door. Imagine believing in what God said, assenting to this principle, life is in the blood, understanding the idea of life being released, and even going through the process of of sacrificing the animal and collecting his blood and roasting the meal and never putting it on your door. It's another way of saying that believing the fact is not enough to save. No, they had to act on the fact. They had to respond to the fact. They had to mark the door if they were ever going to be placed under the sheltering protection of its power, of the blood. And this is what the Bible, by the way, calls faith. Faith is not merely intellectual assent to some set of propositions or truths. Now, faith is always trusting obedience. Faith is trusting in the promises of God and the provisions of God and the commands of God. I heard this really great illustration from Don Carson. Um, Don Carson uh, from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, uh, one of the, I believe, founders of the Gospel Coalition, one of my just favorite, favorite, favorite evangelical scholars today. We don't, I don't agree with him on everything. He's more reformed than I am, and that's fine. We don't have to have a perfect agreement on everything. But man, what a just deep, profound pastoral theologian. I love the man, and I love when he talks, and he uh, shared this illustration one time that I, I, tried, I tried to capture it. I won't do it as good as he does it, but I'm going to do my very best. So he tells a story of, he, he, he says, picture two Jews, one by the name of Smith and the other by the name of Brown. This is some great Jewish names, aren't they? <laughs> Smith and Brown. <laughs> picture two Jews by the name of Smith and Brown. They're having a discussion earlier that day before the evening of the Passover there in the land of Goshen. And Smith says, man, are you, you getting nervous about what's going to take place tonight? And Brown says, well, no. I mean, God told us what to do through his servant Moses and haven't you done what you, what you were told to do? And Smith says, well, of course I did. I'm not stupid. But it's still kind of scary if you think about it. After all that's been going on around here recently with flies and, and uh, hail and the, the river turning to blood. And, and now we're, we're the firstborn, they're going to be killed. I mean, you have three sons, but I only have one son. And I love my Charlie and the angel of death is passing through. I know what God said and I've put the blood where he said to, but it's still pretty scary. And man, I'm going to be glad when this night is over. To which Brown replies, bring it on. I trust the promises of God. Now that night, the angel of death came through and the question is, which one of them lost their son? Well, the answer, of course, is neither. Because death does not pass over them on the ground of the intensity or the clarity of the faith exercised, but on the ground of the blood of the Lamb. There is the ground of all faith and of all human assurance before God. It's not in the intensity, but the object of your faith that saves you. It's not the amount of faith you put into the bridge you choose to cross. There was one person that had all the faith in the world that that bridge was going to make him, get him across. But guess what? The object of their faith was not sufficient. But for the other, who could only muster up a little bit of faith. And as they took that first trembling step, found that that bridge was safe. And a little bit of faith in a bridge like that is enough to deliver you to the other side. No one is simply saved because blood has been shed. We are not universalists here. 
the idea that Jesus died and because his blood was spilled, all of the human race is now saved and in, in, in right relationship with God and everyone will be saved in the end. We don't believe that here. We're not universalists. Yes, Christ died for all the world, to be sure. He didn't die for just a small group of people. He died. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Christ died for everybody. But in order to experience the life-saving benefits of this sacrifice for you, you must place yourself beneath the blood by faith. And whether it's the faith the size of a mountain or whether it's faith the size of a mustard seed, what matters is not the quantity. What matters is the object. But unlike the, the, the opening exercise for the kids with the two identical bridges and you didn't really know which was which and you never really had any really assurance of which was which at any point unlike that you don't have to wonder if the blood of Jesus is sufficient to save you because his resurrection proved it his resurrection proved that everything he ever said about himself and everything he's ever offering to you all his promises are true it's all the validation you need to take a step out in faith how can I know he can be trusted because he rose from the dead I can trust someone that can pull that off. Name me one other, religion, one other religion that can claim that. That their founder died and came back to life. Unless they do that, unless they pull that off, you're no different than me or, or anyone else. You're just another guy. Jesus is not just another guy. And his blood is not just some other guy's blood. He's the perfect, spotless lamb who gave his life that you could have it. You could have his life. His blood can flow through you. And he proved it. And because of that, your life in the present and your life in the future can be secure in him. Has your faith, church, found a resting place? Is your faith in your own ability to save yourself? Is it in your riches, your treasures, your own abilities, your own righteousness? Is your faith in Jesus plus some other thing? Or is your faith exclusively in the blood of the Lamb of God? In light of the coming judgment of God upon the rebellion and wickedness of man in the great and terrible day of the Lord, I call you to trust in the provision that God has already made to see you through it. Place the blood of the lamb on the door of your heart by faith and find your rest and peace and life in him and his life in you. Let us pray. All glory and honor and power and praise be unto you, O Lord our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus, your name is the name above all names. It is the only name by which anyone might be saved. And at the name of Jesus, everything on earth and in heaven and under the earth, every single entity that ever existed will kneel and bow at the sound of your name the marvelous, matchless name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrificial, substitutionary, atoning death for me and for us and for all the world. The most innocent victim, the most perfect victim, and because of who you are, what you did can change who we are. And your grace isn't just wiping off the, the ledger, clearing the ledger of what we've done. Your grace transforms us. And we're optimistic about that here. And we believe that by faith, you not only save, but you sanctify and you cleanse and you renew and you give us your own mind and your own heart. And we're not what we used to be. The old is gone, the new has come. Lord, may we be your new creations here today. I pray for any person here who has been wavering in their faith, any person here who has been divided in their faith, 
any person here who has been placing their faith in anything else but you. Lord, may we all place every bit of our faith, whether it's a little bit or a lot, may every bit of it that we have be put in you and you alone. And if we do, today is the day of salvation. Be glorified in our midst as we proclaim your mercies to the world and to one another. Amen.